Zimmer with us this evening for the program. Carl is a journalist for the New York Times and a two-time award winner from the AAAS for excellence in science journalism. He is the author of several notable books and he actually just published his ninth book. It's an e-book. It came out just about a day ago and it's called Brain Cuttings, 15 Journeys Through the Mind. Uh, this book represents his first dip into a new kind of publishing. Carl will discuss the inner workings of the brain this evening, as well as how books and ideas are emerging and changing amidst rapid shifts of technology and the wellspring of the human mind. Carl also hosts a regular podcast uh, called Meet the Scientist, which is hosted with Microworld. So I'd like to thank Carl again and welcome him to the podium this evening. Carl? Oh, thank you, Amy. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, I was a little worried that you were going to have to fight your way through a nor'easter, but it seems like uh, that's moved on to where I live. So um, when I get home, I might find my house floating out into the Long Island Sound. <laughs> so it's good to be here. Um, and um, I, I apologize for subjecting you to this kind of gruesome image uh, while uh, you were waiting to start. Um, I know it might be a little creepy uh, and, and a little off-putting, but I didn't actually put it up there for shock value. Um, this is actually, for me, a really important image. It's almost kind of an icon for me in terms of the communication of science. And it might also seem a little disorienting to see what looks like old media uh, on an evening when we're going to talk about new media. But as I'll explain, this is, in its own way, very new media. Um, I'm, I'm not going to be making too many grand pronouncements about the future of, of science communication and all. I'm really going to just tell you about my own experience. Um, I think that that's all that any of us can do at this point. Um, this is definitely not the time to be drawing huge, ridiculous generalizations, because I don't think that anybody really quite knows what's going on. But to, uh, to start out, I want to show you an even gorier image. Um, this is an illustration from a, a book by uh, one of the greatest uh, physicians in the Middle Ages, uh, a, a 14th century English doctor named John Ardern. Now, Ardern was very well versed in the ancient writings about medicine, like the, by the Roman physician Galen. <clears throat> Apparently, he was also um, incredibly skilled in surgery, having uh, learned a lot of valuable lessons uh, as a military surgeon in the Hundred Years' War. Uh, he put together a lot of his discoveries and knowledge into a book, which was called The Art of Medicine and Surgery. The anatomy here is obviously a little on the simple side, um, but it's pretty good for the Middle Ages. Um, and as good as it was, however, um, Ardern's uh, knowledge didn't actually live very long past his death. And the problem was how his knowledge was transmitted. So this image was uh, painted by hand on a piece of parchment. There, there was a series of pieces of parchment that were stitched together. So his book actually measured 18 feet long. And it would be rolled up and tucked away for safekeeping. So first, there must have just been one copy of this book. And when there was one copy of the book, uh, there could only be uh, one person reading it. In order for there to be two people reading the book at the same time, somebody, like this guy, would have to paint that painting by hand again, and they would have to write out the entire book, all 18 feet of it. Um, now, that did happen, but it happened very slowly. And it was too slow to replace the books that were being lost. So that not very long after Ardern's death, most of the, his books had disappeared, and his reputation really vanished with them so that we really don't know very much about what John Ardern knew. And so his knowledge couldn't be transmitted very far or for very long. So these are the kinds of challenges that science communication faced 600 years ago. 
Um, that changed radically in the 1400s uh, with the invention of movable type by uh, Johann Gutenberg. So, for example, here we have uh, the Gutenberg Bible, which was actually printed on a machine, on a printing press. Um, we lost a lot of things when we no longer had those beautiful hand-painted scrolls. Um, but we got a lot of other things in exchange. We got the mass production of books, so books could be replicated precisely. You didn't have to hope that a monk got all the words right or got the picture just so. Um, books could be spread rapidly. This is actually the time when the first book fair showed up. There were book merchants. Um, and scientific debates could actually now be carried out in print because everybody in Europe could read what the latest thinking was on some, some issue of scientific controversy. It became a lot harder for books to disappear. Now, on the other hand, there were some new things that came along that weren't so pleasant. So, for example, piracy. Uh, if someone uh, went to great effort to write a book and a printer went to great effort to typeset the book and had the plates ready and was uh, coming out with, with a new book, um, if someone was able to get that book and reset, the, reset it, which happened a lot, um, that meant that um, all the profits from that book would disappear. It sounds awfully familiar. So let's jump forward now to the, uh, the 1500s. So um, we're leaving the time of John Ardern, and now we're going to the time of uh, Andreas Vesalius. Now, uh, like Ardern, Vesalius was a gifted doctor. He was a particularly skilled anatomist. And he taught uh, anatomy in the center of medical research in, uh, in, the, in the Renaissance, which is Padua. And he did something pretty radical, which was he actually looked for himself at the human body and discovered, to his surprise, that Galen was uh, pretty far off. Uh, it turned out that Galen had only been really paying careful attention to animals and because of various taboos in the ancient world, hadn't actually done any autopsies on humans. So Vesalius, working with artists, created some large charts, uh, sort of freestanding charts, which he used in his class. Now, somehow, these got pirated and started circulating around in Europe. They were very popular. But they were, uh, they were lost, uh, for the most part. Um, and then, uh, for reasons that aren't entirely clear, um, when Vesalius, uh, I believe it was when he was around 30, he burned all his own medical papers, uh, became a physician to kings, and his work as a, as a science communicator, shall we say, and as a teacher were over. So um, he might have become forgotten like John Ardern, if not for the fact that he wrote a book. And he wrote a book with movable type. And so it's called De Humani Corporis Fabrica. Um, and he wrote it because he didn't actually like the fact that his charts were being stolen. Uh, he didn't appreciate it, in part because every time that the charts were being copied and passed around, the accuracy was being degraded. And he felt that his reputation was de being degraded, too. So what he wanted to do is he wanted to present his discoveries in full with pictures and with text to show everyone what the human body was really like. Um, so this was something new. This was something that uh, no one had really tried before on this scale. And the, this stage of uh, printing was also so new that really Vesalius was kind of making up the rules as he went along. So he went to Venice where he collaborated with artists and they made uh, wood engravings. They used uh, wood from pear trees and made 200 engravings. And Vesalius wrote a letter to a printer, his, the one printer he would let uh, print his book, who was in Basel, Switzerland, uh, by the name of Operinus. And he, in this letter, which somehow still survived, he said, I'm sending you these blocks and this manuscript. And he laid out how he wanted this book to be published. So the blocks were put on mules, and the mules went over the Alps, and it took five weeks or so for one of the most important books in the history of Western thought 
to make it to the printer. Um, and fortunately, it made it. Uh, and once O'Brien has got uh, the blocks and the manuscript, uh, he and his printers worked like crazy. They typeset 700 pages, and that's with type and with these engravings. And within a year of Vesalius writing that letter, the book was published. So I think of this as kind of a Renaissance version of print on demand. Um, it was a real tour de force. Uh, and the, one of the reasons that Vesalius had chosen this printer in Basel was because it was a strategic place to, to print a book. Because it's not far from Switzerland to Frankfurt. Maybe you've heard of the Frankfurt Book Fair. Well, there was actually a Frankfurt Book Fair back then. And they brought the book there to, to sell it. Uh, and it was a huge hit. Um, Vesalius was really interested in getting this book to the book fair and to other places as fast as he could because he was terrified of these book pirates. Um, and rightly so. Um, the book was a huge hit. It sold 4,000 copies uh, in a matter of about a year or so. And if you think about the population of Europe then, that's quite impressive. There was no one-click uh, purchasing of books back then. Uh, there were pirated editions coming out within a couple years. Uh, nevertheless, they came out with a new edition in 1555, and it sold just as well. Now, uh, we, th we look back at Vesalius today as one of the great uh, figures in Western medicine um, because he made um, a, an image of the body that was far more accurate than anything that had come before. So this picture of the brain is far more detailed than that kind of pink mush I showed you from John Ardern's picture. Uh, and these are pictures and, and text with it that were reproducible. So each time someone ran off a new printing off those blocks, um, they were just as good as before. In fact, in 1934, uh, Americans actually went and found Vesalius' blocks and ran off a new edition that was sold in the United States. And the people who ran, who, who printed off of those blocks said that they were just as fresh as they must have been 400 years ago. Um, unfortunately, the blocks for this picture and the 200 or so others in Fabrica are gone. Uh, they were destroyed in Munich during the bombing in World War II. Um, but, but I was able to get this off the internet, uh, <laughs> the National Library of Medicine. So it's made it far enough to be, to be preserved in our new kind of uh, transmission. So, um, so, so for me, this image, is, it, it really speaks to a, a transformation in how science is communicated. Uh, and, and I think about it a lot today in my own work, because I think that we are all going through a similar transition. Uh, and for me, uh, it, it's particularly striking when I think back to my own work as a science writer. I've been doing this for about 20 years. And I can pretty much cleanly divide my career into two parts. Um, I can call it AW and BW, before the web and after the web. Each one was about 10 years. So, so this is BW. <laughs> I got my uh, start at a place called um, Discover Magazine. Um, that actually down there at the bottom of that picture is a mailing label, which meant that this was actually put in the mail and someone actually brought it to your mailbox and you opened it and you read it and you turned the pages and there were ads on the pages. <laughs> I know it sounds strange to the uh, younger set, but this did happen. I know it still happens, but um, at the time, that was the only game in town. Um, and you know, we, we would publish stories that were seven, several thousand words long, and uh, we had lots of ads, uh, because there was no other place for those kinds of ads to be placed. Uh, it was a different time. Uh, um, after working on staff for Dis at Discover for a few years, I uh, later began to write for a lot of other places, uh, particularly for the New York Times. And so on Tuesdays, when the Science Times comes out, sometimes uh, my uh, stories would be published, like this one. And so I'd go down the driveway and I'd pick up a big, thick wad of paper, and I would come back and I'd get a pair of scissors, and I'd cut my clipping and I'd put it in a notebook, because that was the only way <laughs> that I could save it. Um, again, I, I guess I'm really dating myself here. I, you know, I, I have not actually dealt with uh, illuminated manuscripts, but <laughs> I've, I've been around. Um, 
I, I even wrote books made out of paper. Um, because sometimes those several thousand words in an article weren't quite enough. Uh, I'm proud to say that all these books are in print, but it, it's important to think about what that means. What that means is that it's still worthwhile to a publisher somewhere to keep hundreds or thousands of physical copies of those books in a building somewhere. That's what being in print means, at least for now. And then things changed. Uh, so all parts of my world have uh, been really, I'd say, turned upside down. Uh, and I, I never would have expected this kind of a change to happen as fast as it's had. Um, and for me, this graph um, is one particularly striking illustration of that. So this is the number of people employed in the newspaper industry. Um, and as you can see, things hit a peak around the late 80s kind of declined a little, and then in the past, I'd say seven or eight years, have gone into a, a serious uh, free fall. Um, sometimes just, sometimes to, to scare students, I show them this, you know, after they've, you know, finished a major in journalism. <laughs> uh, because they can see what's happened in the past four years that they've been getting their journalism major. But I think it's important that they know that. Um, unfortunately, um, when newspapers have suffered, it's the science sections that have been hit hardest. Uh, I'm very happy that the New York Times is still uh, putting a lot of resources into the Science Times, but as you can see, nationwide, we've lost a lot of science coverage in newspapers. Um, now for me, uh, that transition from uh, BW to AW happened where that red line is. And I, it's not like I could see the future. Um, I actually was getting kind of tired of sending uh, newspaper clips and magazine clips to prospective editors and saying, here's what I do and I'd like to, to work for you. It was just a pain in the neck. Um, but so what I thought was, well, there are these websites, so why don't I put some of my articles on a website and then I could just send someone a, a link to an article online? Um, because at the time, a lot of magazines didn't have their own websites yet. Uh, one exception being Discover Magazine. Um, now, uh, this was 10 years ago, just about exactly. So there were no like nice and easy templates. You couldn't just go to Google and get something. I mean, you had to build these things by hand. And I cannot build things like this by hand. So I recognized back then that, that having friends who know code is a really great thing. <laughs> and one of my sort of long running partners in crime has been someone named Charles Nix, who was a wonderful book designer and who was interested in the web. So he helped me set up this website and what was interesting to me was that it started taking on kind of a life of its own. Um, it was no longer just a repository for articles. Um, people would be searching for information and they would end up at my website because I'd written an article on something they were interested in. It could be carnivorous plants, it could be musical hallucinations. And they might send me an email saying, I found your article on your website and it was really helpful, thank you. Um, I would start to put information about giving talks like this one here. Uh, and basically the website started taking on more and more of an importance in, in my work as kind of like, not just like an online portfolio, but, but kind of um, a place where people could, in, in a strange way, kind of have a conversation with me. They could find out the kinds of things I'm interested in, what I write about, find out something about me. It's, it's strange. Um, you know, I, I asked myself, am I Carl Zimmer or carlzimmer.com? And I think a lot of journalists now ask themselves that question. Um, so seven years ago, in 2003, um, I discovered a new kind of way of being on the web and a, and a new system of software. There was this thing that people called weblogs. Some people called them blogs, which is a hideous, ugly name. But that's what we're stuck with. Um, and what intrigued me was that this was, um, <clears throat> this was a way that you could, in a sense, publish your own articles. Uh, and they could have a look that was just, uh, could be about as professional as a magazine on the web. Uh, but, it, but it was different as well, because it, suddenly I was getting comments. You know, it used to be at Discover that our you know, community was a letters to the editor page, and that was it. And you'd hear about people liking or not liking your story six months after it came out. 
Now, within seconds, you knew if it was any good or not. Um, and what's particularly interesting to me is that um, you get into all sorts of unexpected um, situations. So I saw somebody with a science tattoo, a geneticist I know, and, and so I just said to my readers, um, so do a lot of scientists have science tattoos? I don't know. Uh, and uh, I've gotten hundreds of tattoos. I had to set up a special part on my blog for them, and I'm actually uh, working on a book of, of these, of these what's called Science Inc, because, you know, it, there's just amazing stuff. And there's actually, like, fascinating stories behind why each person got their tattoo. Uh, you know, it, but it's the readers who really made it, uh, who really brought it together. I was, I was there kind of as a curator, in a sense. Um, but again, you can't predict in advance what's going to happen when you start doing a system like this. Um, Another thing that really interested me uh, with, um, with blogging was that, um, that software online was becoming uh, easier and easier to, to integrate different kinds of media. So you didn't just have to illustrate your stories with a photograph or a painting. You could, for example, if you're writing about bats, and if you're writing about the discovery that vampire bats can, can walk and run on the ground, um, you can actually embed a movie. So I did a post about bat flight and bat biomechanics. And there are these beautiful high definition movies that scientists make all the time. And you can just drop it in with a bit of code and you've got yourself moving illustrations. Um, so so for, for me, this is, this, is a, this, this is kind of a bit of a revelation. I mean, it's not quite the invention of movable type, but to be able to do things like this in combination with writing is quite amazing to me. Uh, <clears throat> so now, uh, you know, it used to be that blogs were, that was the only way that you could uh, do this kind of new um, communication online. Uh, but things are blurring away. It's really hard to draw any clean boundaries. So um, I, I do podcasts, as, uh, uh, as Amy had mentioned, uh, and I've done video. And I do all this like from my desk, <laughs> uh, which again is extraordinary. There, you do not need a giant uh, radio studio or you don't need someone with a 200 pound camera. Things are so small and so good and so inexpensive that uh, really uh, just about anybody can, can use these tools. And so I'm trying to learn how to use these tools myself. So when, when, I, when I first started blogging, um, there were a lot of um, journalists in, in, in the maybe 10 or 15 years older than I was who were kind of shocked and confused and would ask me to come give talks about this blogging thing. And it seemed very alien and foreign to them. And, and uh, a lot of people were quite hostile to it. A lot of those same people now blog every day. And it seems totally normal and mainstream. Uh, now, if you want to sort of make fun of something that's not really journalism, you make fun of things like Twitter and Facebook. Um, you, with a name like Twitter, it really invites um, uh, teasing. Um, but I've been very uh, uh, interested in experimenting with it. Um, now, you, because the fact is that between these two social networks, you've got hundreds of millions of people reading these things and getting links to articles. This is where the people are, and this is where people are reading. So if you're going to be, um, if you're, if you're going to be a writer, this is where you've got to be. Um, now, you, I, you don't, obviously don't have to explain Twitter in 140 characters. Uh, you don't have to explain quantum mechanics in 140 uh, characters, but at least you can lead people like with a link to something longer. Um, but that question of something longer uh, is, is a, a, a tricky issue, and, and it's an interesting one. Um, so, so now we have things like uh, the iPad and Kindles and Nooks and all sorts of other machines <clears throat> that promise to potentially um, be a new way of communicating. Now, um, 
I'm always sort of struck by the appearance of, of the iPad. I don't know if you've seen the movie 2001. I'm always reminded of the monolith in 2001 that, that uh, it's going to you know, basically take our species to a new level. You get that a lot from publishers. Uh, I, I, I think that a lot of people in publishing think that they can just take their books and their magazines and just stick them on something like this and everything will go back to the way it was. And that's not going to happen. Um, it doesn't make sense. It would be a bit like saying, OK, Gutenberg, um, this press is very cool and all. Now, we've got this 18-foot uh, book here. Now, if you could just print an 18-foot book, we will be great. Okay, the 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 format really uh, makes uh, demands and opens up opportunities uh, that just don't exist in the previous previous forms. Now, I totally believe in approaching these things with skepticism. You know, if this was this is an ad from 1986 about the the great new future of electronic books. If you were a writer and said, that's it, paper is dead, I'm going with the electronic books, that would be a bit like uh, John Ardern in the 1300s saying, that's it, no more parchment for me. I'm going for movable type, except there is no movable type. Um, so, uh, but now um, we're at the point where like, if you were to ignore electronic books, it would be, I think, like ignoring movable type. Now, obviously. Um, this is, it's a little awkward. Um, you know, I was actually gave a, a, a talk about a book that uh, came out a couple years ago called Microcosm. And I was sitting there signing books, and someone just came and said, well, I've got your book on Kindle. It was the first time I had seen one of my books on a Kindle. And I was like, what do you want me to do? <laughs> I'm not going to you know, put a Sharpie all over your screen. So I said, oh, just take a picture. And he put it on his blog. Um, <laughs> We will be abandoning some of our cherished rituals, like you know, the book signing. That that will that will become less common. Um, but you know, we abandoned some things when we went from parchment to movable type. The fact is that you just that ebooks have become um, its own ecosystem. You have millions of ebooks that have been sold. Um, uh, I read one number that 35 million books have been downloaded to the iPads alone. So people are, are buying these, they are reading them, and uh, people are starting to think, well, maybe you know, I don't just have to write books on paper that then get turned into an e-book. Maybe there are other possibilities. One possibility um, is that you can write things that maybe a book publisher wouldn't be interested in. There are services uh, like Smashwords, and even Amazon itself has set up services where you give them, you the writer, give them a file, just a Microsoft Word file, and they turn it into an ebook and they put it in their store. <laughs> End of story. So um, when I started hearing about that, I thought, well, this is, this is, um, this is interesting. This is, this, this is something that I want to explore. This is something really, really quite new. Um, now, there are some concerns to have in this kind of a, 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 an ecosystem. So you know, piracy became a big problem for Vesalius, because if you could typeset a book, if you could copy a book through typesetting, you could sell lots and lots of copies. It's even easier with digital books. You just copy. And uh, it, you, uh, you put it on a torrent site, and things get bad in a, in a hurry. But you know, if, if Vesalius could deal with that, surely we can confront that as well and look at the, at the, the possibilities in this format. So, um, so that's what I uh, have done recently. Um, I have been writing, for a couple years now, I've been writing a column for Discover Magazine about the brain. And I've been writing some other articles for other places about neuroscience. And fortunately, I still hold on to the rights <clears throat> to, to these stories. So I thought to myself, you know, people, they read them in magazines, and then they maybe throw the magazines away, or maybe they never saw these columns. <clears throat> um, and so why don't I just see what happens if I put these together and create a book out of them? Um, so. The first thing I did was I got back in touch with my friend Charlie Nix. Um, and so 
I gave him a, a, just a bare bones Microsoft Word file. And in very little time, he gave me back <clears throat> a very simple file that I could have sent to Kindle right away. And I said, whoa, whoa, whoa hold on a second. Um, for one thing, I actually needed to edit it. Um, and for another thing, I don't want to be the author of a Microsoft Word file. You know, I want to be the author of a book. I still want to be an author of a book. So, um, so I began, began to collaborate with Charles Nix and his partner, George Scott. They, they run a firm called Scott and Nix. Um, and we put together um, a book that I, uh, that I decided to call Brain Cuttings. And, um, and this is the cover. Uh, and I told you that this, this image was really special to me, and uh, so I decided to put it on the cover of, of this ebook. It's been a very interesting experience. For one thing, um, I've learned that ebooks are at about the point now, in terms of software, as websites were about 10 years ago. So, um, you know, book designers, if they're making real books, they have computer software like uh, InDesign, for example, where they're incredibly powerful. And they take care of a lot of the little things for you. Um, you know, if you change the margins, you don't have to change them on every single page. That sort of thing. That actually doesn't really exist for ebooks yet. So it's it's a big pain in the neck. So if you format something for the Kindle, it's you got to do it differently for uh, for something that's going to work on iPads. It so. It still takes a lot of work, but it's, it's going to change. Um, and it's interesting to get involved in it now and see how it's going to change. Um, so uh, so we, we dealt with all these issues, these glitches, these typos, and so on. <clears throat> but it didn't take very long. I kind of got this idea over the summer. We really only started dealing with this, um, I'd say, in September, maybe. You know, last month, we were sending a lot of email back and forth. Um, and now it's for sale. I mean, I can, I can turn on my Kindle. Um, and I'll take a second. And there it is. I actually decided to buy it for myself to see that it actually worked. <laughs> and it does. And um, you know, I, I'm, I'm hoping that the experience is just as satisfying as, as reading a real book. And it has other advantages, that it's fast. You, know, you can put these things together quickly. Um, we actually discovered uh, a few small but really annoying typos uh, after we uh, put it out. So I went to Charlie and I was like, we need a new edition. Um, Jonathan Franzen, um, <clears throat> who just wrote a novel called uh, Freedom, had a rather horrible experience. Um, the British edition of his book came out, 80,000 copies. Uh, the book was, was printed based on a file that was not the final file. All 80,000 copies pulped. Uh, Charlie just basically had to deal, you know, go in and change a few words, and then click a button. And in a couple days, we had a new edition. Um, so that gives you a little glimpse at how different this experience is. Um, so um, you know, it's, it's interesting to me that, um, that Amazon itself, I think, has been thinking along the same lines as I have and as a lot of other writers I've been talking to have. <clears throat> One thing we, we uh, recognize with, with e-books is that um, you don't have to feel yourself limited to writing a, a book that makes sense for a traditional book publisher. Um, you're not going to see a 40-page book for sale in a bookstore. It just doesn't make sense. It's, it's not because book publishers don't like 40-page books. It's that in terms of the cost of printing and the, the, the kind of money that they need to make off of books, it's just not going to work. Magazines are, rare, are just about never going to uh, publish like a 30 or 40-page article. And I, I challenge you to read a 30,000-word blog post on a computer screen. <laughs> But with something like electronic ink, which is very easy on the eyes, um, you can do it. Um, so, so my book is not as, not as long as a full-blown book, um, but it can, it's, uh, it's 15 different pieces that I've written. So it just falls somewhere in between. I think it's interesting. I think people will enjoy it. We'll see. Um, Amazon has come up with something now called um, Amazon Singles. Um, or no, I'm sorry, Kindle Singles. They just announced it yesterday, 
where they're going to be going to writers and, and actually asking them for 10,000 to 30,000 word pieces that they're going to sell at a, at a, at a corresponding price. So even Amazon is, is thinking about what we can do with this new medium. Um, I, I, for one, feel like, you know, like I felt starting a website or starting my first blog. I don't know where it's going to go, um, but, um, but, I, I, um, but you know, I do know one thing, which is that I'm not going to be doing it alone. Um, uh, there, there might be sort of a romantic notion that you're, you know, you're a writer and you're just connecting with, uh, with your readers. But, but as I had mentioned, um, it's not that easy. Uh, and, but you know, th the fact is that making books has always been a communal effort. It was so for Vesalius, working for his artists, working with his artists and his printers. And I think 400 years later, it remains true today. So thank you very much. And um, I believe we can um, take some questions. So thanks. Speaking of uh, new media and uh, everything that is happening in the, uh, the online world, um, for those of you who are online, you can tweet your questions to at microworld. And we also, we already have a few questions that I will be reading to Carl. And then if you'll read them back into the microphone. Sure. And if you're in the audience here in person, kind of bridging this divide between the two, if you will signal, and then I will point to you. And there's a microphone in the back of the room. And when you go to the microphone, if you would state your name, affiliation, and your question for Carl, so I will start it off with a question that we have received from Twitter. So this question comes from, I believe it's Kia Giles, is asmus at twitter.com. And the question, Carl, is one thing I like about hard copy books is sharing them with my friends. How do you do that with ebooks, really? Um, how do, yes, how, so the question is, um, the, 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 the person is saying that they, they like hardcover books and because they can share them with friends. How can you do that with e-books? And I don't know. Um, I, I, I don't. I mean, obviously, with, with a Kindle, it, they build that into it. That's part of their business model. And there is a big debate right now about whether um, this, this is a good thing or not. <clears throat> and there are a lot of people that are arguing that um, once you buy one of these ebooks, it should be yours, yours to just pass on to whoever you want. Um, I, I, would, I, would, I would love it if people could say, say to their friends, oh, I read this ebook and I thought it was great, check it out. Um, on the other hand, it is uh, so very easy for uh, ebooks to, um, to be pirated. Um, it really just takes one click for a file to end up uh, on some server somewhere on the other side of the world at where, where uh, people can just grab it. Um, and that's it in terms of trying to, in terms of trying to make a, a living as, as a writer doing those things. Um, but on the other hand, um, uh, Cory Doctorow, a, a writer, has made a very vigorous case that um, you should just Forget about it. Just just let that happen, and then sell hardcover books to to actually make money as a writer. Um, but I just don't I don't see that personally as a, as making much sense in the long term because um, because those hard those those hardcover books those those paperback books they're big, they're going to become a smaller and smaller part of the book industry. I, so I don't have a very good answer for it, um, but it is a good question. <laughs> Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Would you go back? Yeah. If you just go back to the microphone. Yeah. Yeah, my name is Steve Walker from National Science Foundation. How are the books copyright protected, if at all? Um, <clears throat> you know, you, you, copyright uh, applies on the internet as it does anywhere else. So, you know, we these things. You know, this ebook ha is copyrighted. Uh, it has an ISBN number. Um, it, it's it's just as copyrighted as a physical book. Um, the, the, the fact that someone might try to steal an e-book and put it on a, on a torrent, what they call a torrent site, where anyone can download it for free, doesn't change the fact that it's copyrighted. That's why 
when people t steal copyrighted material, it's stealing, even when it's an ebook. Um, but you know, obviously, the fact that it's copyrighted may not uh, may not be that big of a defense against piracy. It's an issue that the, the, the publishing industry is going to have to deal with in one way or another over the next few years. But people could put the link on Facebook or Twitter, and then they could link people there to purchase it if they like it. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I think part. I mean, I, I think um, something I've noticed is that um, the relationship between writers and readers is changing a lot. So um, you know, I know that there are. I get emails and comments from a lot of people who who say they like what I write and and they want to support me in doing my writing. So you know, the, that that goodwill can be expressed by saying, "Okay, I'm going to buy this person's book." Um, some people have um, you know suggested putting up you know buttons where you you know you uh, there's a company called Kachingle where you, you say, you know, I like this person and what they do, I'm going to hit this button, and every month I'm going to donate $5 to this site or what have you. Um, so these are different kinds of models for, for making all this financially uh, viable. Um, the old models are going to have to either change or get totally replaced. Um, yes. I do have a question from the member of the audience here. His question is he's over 80 years of age mm -hmm. and has been retired for 17 years. And he wants to know what about books such as brain cuttings that are only online, and if he's not using online tools, how can he access those books? Well, um, I, I, like I said, this is this is an experiment. So right now, this would be the you know a Kindle would, or, or or a computer would be the way the only way to get it. You can actually read ebooks just on a regular computer as well. You just need there's free software, for example, Amazon gives you software that you can download and read on your computer. If you don't have any computer, um, you know, maybe next year we may do some sort of print-on-demand um, uh, uh, program. We're not sure yet. We're, we're, again, it's an experiment. You know, we may get a bunch of emails from people saying, I don't want an e-book. I want, I want to hold this. We'll see. And print-on-demand is another option. Um, but in, but in any case, um, uh, right now, it, this particular book only exists in e-books. All my other books still in print on paper. So if that's any consolation. Sorry. Yes, um, I'm not really computer literate. But um, I wonder, uh, is it computer uh, friendly to have uh, the readability of the book versus a hard copy book that's more readable because on the computer you can't put it in bold print or yeah. color print, you know. And then, <clears throat> and then too, um, is your book available in hard copy or is it just um, available on the computer? So um, the um, so. Th the, these these ebooks are, are getting very powerful in terms of different ways of looking at them. So, um, so iPads, for example, have color on them. Kindles are only in black and white, but with one click of a button, you can change the the size of the type, and it automatically reconfigures itself. It's it's pretty amazing from a sort of typographic uh, point of view. Um, you know, and these things are getting cheaper and cheaper. So I think that. Things like Kindles will be uh, like cell phones uh, in terms of how much they cost. They're not going to cost very much in in the near future. So, um, so, so even people who might say like, "Oh, I don't know. I don't think I want to buy one," including me. I mean, I just bought this recently. Um, more and more people are going to feel like, "Oh, I, I'm going to uh, get this now because it's it's more affordable and it's and it's and it's easy to use," and and they do read pretty well. I have to say. This is not a computer screen. This is different. This is called electronic ink. Kindle. Yes? It, you say the Kindle one is a little more readable? Than... Yeah, I think that the Kindle, I, this is just me talking, and I'm oh, <laughs> getting okay. no money from Amazon here. Just, but the thing is that Kindles use electronic ink. So there are little particles embedded in here. And basically what happens is you press a button, a pa and some of the little uh, particles pop up to the top of the screen. And they form a pattern like a page. And then they just stay there. 
And so it's not, you know, a, a regular computer monitor is sort of flashing on and off 60 times a second. Uh, for a lot of people, myself included, after, you know, a reading for a while, it, it really wears your eyes out, but not, but not Kindles. All right, thanks. Thank, book thank you. Hard, not yet. <laughs> Maybe next year. All right. Um, Carl, I have a question that came through on Twitter. It's from Heather C. Her question is, like creating your own website, has Twitter changed the way you approach journalism? How do you like to use Twitter? So it's a question <laughs> specifically about the use of Twitter. So, um, so I like reading Twitter because you know there are several dozen people who read lots of interesting things and, and make notes about them and, and give little links. And they, they are, um, what they find interesting, I find interesting. So I enjoy that, just getting information through Twitter uh, that I might not get through a newspaper or other things. Um, in terms of what I put onto Twitter, um, it's a very effective way to, um, uh, to, to put out things that I think are interesting. Um, or funny, or, and my own work. So uh, every time an article of mine appears in the New York Times, I, I just put a little uh, thing uh, in Twitter just pointing people to the article. Um, and then people might start asking me questions on Twitter about the subject of the article. And you know, I, when I sit down again and look at my computer, I can just answer back. And it's all very fast. Um, and, uh, but it's, you know, it's, it's growing. I mean, it, uh, uh, it's 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 a strange it's a strange way to to interact with a lot of people. So I have like like thirty thousand followers or something like that. I don't even know what that means, but um, but it's but it's interesting, and uh, and and so so I am sort of playing around with how how you can spread information through a system like Twitter. Hi, good evening. Hi. My name is Esther French, and I'm a journalism student at mm -hmm. the University of Maryland. And I have a question about how publishing this ebook has changed your perspective on blogging and how it's affected what you choose to write about in your blog posts. Um, it, I don't think it's changed it much because in my own writing, blogging already had a pr pretty distinct uh, place in my kind of landscape. Of, of, of basically, I, I like to write blog posts. Um, quickly on things that I find really interesting, but might be kind of a hard sell to an editor at a magazine or a newspaper. I find them interesting, um, and some other people might, but you know, maybe an editor might say, oh, I'm not sure this has broad appeal. Um, and sometimes those, by pursuing the things that I'm particularly interested in, I turn out to hit on something that um, it is actually very interesting. So it's, it's also interesting to, to me to see which blog posts sort of vanish without a trace and which ones get uh, linked to and passed on Twitter or on Facebook or all over the place. So um, I, I was once really um, amazed by someone telling me about this uh, a parasitic wasp that turns a cockroach into its host, basically by turning it into a zombie. Uh, and I couldn't believe it was real, and I, I look, but I found a scientist who actually studies it, and I just said, well, this is very interesting to me. I don't, I'm not sure how I'd make an article about it. So you just write a blog post. You don't need to ask anyone's permission to write a blog post. Um, and it was just a, it was colossally um, successful. I mean, hundreds of thousands of people literally read it because large websites like Boing Boing would link to it. <clears throat> but in terms of, you know, um, I, I, uh, I, maybe things that I write on a blog might eventually evolve into something I might put on an ebook, but they would have to be something that I thought was a real, uh, of, of enough value that someone's going to want to pay for it. I guess the, the reason that I asked that question yeah. is because you were talking about your Science Inc. book and how that right. really grew out of your blog yeah. and you know, reader contributions to your blog. And so the interaction between your blog posts and, um, and how that forms you know, a book project down the road. Right. So the question is about how blogs can help form book projects. Uh, it, certainly for me, because I don't have to ask anyone's permission, um, the blog becomes kind of a, um, uh, a studio where I can sketch things out and, and try out new things um, and develop things. 
and um, and uh, they become um, they they can kind of gain a head of steam, and maybe I'll develop it into something uh, bigger, or maybe I'm already working on something. So, for example, I wrote a textbook uh, about evolution called The Tangled Bank for for non 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 majors. Um, once I started working on it, you know, it's got lots and lots and lots of examples of different aspects of evolution. Um, as I would come across different examples, you know, I might have a free half hour and I'd say, like, I'm going to make this a blog post. Um, so I'd make it a blog post. And then later when I came to say that, say it was about sexual selection. So later when I got to the chapter on sexual selection, I could say, oh, yeah, right, I already wrote about this. So I could take that material and I've already got something to, to, to start working with already. Um, so they, they, they sort of feed back on each other. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, we have one more question queued up right now in the audience, and then we'll be going back to Twitter. And Heather C said thank you for answering oh. her earlier question. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Uh, Tim Kuczynski, I'm Mirza Handel here at the National Academy. Mm -hmm. And I have the, uh, uh, with, with, with self-publishing and kind of being able to write something, generate an ISBN, and uh, even with like low cost, uh, uh, I can you can print a, a coffee table quality book for about forty bucks. Mm -hmm. The uh, uh, or, or or generate an ISBN and list it on uh, on the iTunes bookstore. Mm -hmm. the, so what do you kind of see as trends for uh, self publishing? So the question is with the with the ease of publishing now um, and self publishing, what what is going to be the trend? Um, the, the number of books published each year keeps going up. I've lost track. But a couple years ago, it was like 200,000 book t different titles a year being published. But it was increasing by tens of thousands. And I'm sure that's accelerating. Um, I'd have to check what it is now. Um, so on the, a lot, and a lot of that is self-publishing or publishing through um, uh, different services that will just you know, you pay a price, they publish your book, and it's available. Um, and that's big business now. Um, so on the one hand, I think that's great. Because if someone wants to write a book, they can. And, and I think that's all for the good. Um, the, the tricky thing is that when you've got two or 300,000 new books, titles, coming out every year, how is it that anybody's going to actually notice your book? especially when a lot of the ways that people um, find out about books, book review sections, are either disappearing or getting smaller. Uh, so I think the trend will be what's sometimes called kind of the long tail. I think there'll be lots and lots of books being published. Uh, relatively few people will be buying them. You know, each one, you know, maybe a few hundred people will buy them. Maybe you, know, you write a book, you tell your friends, and they buy it. But you know, then maybe word of mouth spreads around. Um, so uh, in, in an ironic way, um, the large publishing companies um, will perhaps have an even bigger advantage because they, um, because they still have a lot of ways of getting the word out. They have lots of connections. They can get, they can get to the people who actually still review books. They, they can print up review copies and, and all that. And so, um, so I, I do think that if large publishing companies really want to survive, they have to, to, to really play to, to, to their strengths, one of which is publicity. Uh, Carl, our yes. next question is, comes to you from Twitter, and it's from Judith Price. And her question is, Carl, it seems like the hardest thing is building an audience. Any hints? An aspiring uh, writer? So the question is, uh, uh, well, the statement is, um, that the hardest thing is building an audience. And, and so are there any, um, any advice on that? Um, I, I think recognizing that is, is the first step. I mean, it's true. Um, it, it takes time to build an audience. Um, and, and, and that audience matters. It matters more than ever. Um, and you know, book publishers like it when you say, I've got several thousand followers or, or you know, X thousands of people read my blog. So um, basically, you just have to think about the different ways that you can do that. So you can do it um, 
just as a traditional journalist, say you're on staff somewhere, you really make a name for yourself covering <clears throat> some particular kind of news really well. People associate you with that. Um, if you were a freelancer, you might write for a number of different places, but you find your voice and you find the thing that you really love to write about um, that other people aren't doing a very good job on, and that becomes your calling card. Um, blogs can help in this regard, al although the problem is that blogs are a bit like self-publishing. Blogs are self-publishing, I'm sorry. <laughs> And so there are thousands upon thousands of blogs. So um, don't make the mistake of thinking that if you start a blog, everything go goes from there. You could start a blog and nobody reads it, except maybe your mother. Uh, it has happened. Uh, uh, sir, here? we have three questions from the, um, in audience and then going one back to Twitter. And the nice thing is, even after this wraps up, maybe you could uh, send your questions or write on your blog as well. We'll say that at the yeah. end in case not everyone's covered. But, sir? Yeah, more, right? more questions. Sorry, uh, Lee Pearson, um, Science and Technology Policy Fellow in the National Academy of Engineering. Um, my question is, to what, sense, uh, to what extent do you think uh, e-books will change the role of the editor in the sense that you could have a crowdsourced editor that you have 30,000 followers, if someone had 2 million in one group, they can vote on book ideas. As soon as you hit a certain threshold, that book is now worth writing and publishing, and you don't really need an editor to tell you whether or not it's kind of people. Right. Uh, that is true. So the, qu the question was, what is the, going to be the role of an editor as <clears throat> e-books become more common? Um, so for example, um, you might not need an editor to decide what is valuable to publish because, it's in effect, you've crowdsourced it because there's a large number of people who are really interested in something. And it's true. I mean, I can, um, in terms of that tattoo book, just to give one example, I just needed to show the, the statistics on how many people go to that part of the blog and look at those tattoos. It's astonishing. And they just keep going and going and going. Um, so you know, you show a publisher that, and they say, "Oh, okay, thank you. Yes, well, that that is good." Um, so then it does raise the question: Well, then you know, what then is the role for the editor? Um, I hope that editors don't take what we've been talking about tonight and feel very defensive and be like, "Oh, they're those silly people. They don't understand the importance of editors." Um, I think that editors have to prove their importance, just as writers have to prove our importance. I mean, there are lots of bloggers who write about science and do a pretty good job. So what am I doing, you know, writing e-books and writing newspaper articles that I expect people to pay for? I better be good at it, or the, the, the readership is just going to make its collective decision. I think the same thing is going to be happening with editors. You know, if a writer goes to a, a book publishing company, and this ha I know this happens sometimes. I'm not making this up. So a writer is very excited. They've got a book contract with a good, uh, a good uh, publishing house. They're very excited. They work really hard on their manuscript. They turn it in to the editor, and they don't hear anything. And then at the last minute, there are a few like little questions about the manuscript. And then boom, it's into copy editing. Boom, it's being typeset. Boom, it's in the bookstore. In other words, there is no editing as we traditionally think about it. That does happen, and it happens too often at big publishing houses. I understand why, because the, the editors are so busy, they're, and they're under so much stress. You know, they've got all these titles, and how well those titles do is going to determine their own professional survival. So a lot of them basically say, like, OK, I've got to focus my efforts on marketing the book and doing research on that and so on. Um, one editor that I've worked with, he was, um, he, he sort of gained this reputation as being kind of a quaint, old-fashioned editor because he would sit at his desk and he would actually edit. And, and people would walk by and, and kind of say, oh, look at that. <laughs> um, and you know, that, that's just a reality of book publishing. Um, and, and I understand why it's happening, but I think in the long run it's, it's, it's going to be a problem because people are going to say, well, um, I can hire a freelance editor or I can get I can work with, you know, friends. You know, maybe we can, you know, edit each other or something like that. Um, that that could be a big uh, issue in, in the future of publishing. Uh, sir, yes, in the blue shirt. 
My name is Prashant and I'm a science writer with PNAS. Mm -hmm. Now that there are a number of journalists who are equally comfortable in the newsroom and in the blogosphere, uh, do you think this whole debate over the credibility of blogs versus news stories has become obsolete or do you think they serve different purposes? I, I just, you know, culturally, they're somewhat different things. I mean, the, the, way, the way that po blog posts tend to be written is different from the way that newspaper articles tend to be written. That's just a fact. But that's a cultural thing. That's not some sort of, um, it's not like a syllogism. That isn't like an ironclad rule. So um, there are many cases, too many cases, where I could find a newspaper article on a particular piece of research and a blog post on the same piece of research, and the blog post would be far superior than the newspaper article in terms of uh, accuracy and information and seriousness in getting across the science. Um, so to that extent, I think, it's, um, I think the debate is over. So for example, um, just today it was announced that my fellow Discover blogger, uh, Ed Young, has won an award from the National Academy of Sciences for his online, for, uh, I guess it's online journalism, for his blog, which is called Not Exactly Rocket Science. Um, it's a blog, but um, his, all of his stuff is, is carefully researched, very clear, very interesting. Um, he puts a lot of work into it. Uh, and, and I can put many of his posts up against something from a, um, from a, from a, news, from a newspaper where he would be far superior. Um, not, of course, the New York Times, but... <laughs> but um, <laughs> But, no, but, but I'm, what I'm saying is that what Ed Young does is journalism, period, end of discussion. And the blog is on Discover Magazine. So, I mean, the, 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 the discussion should be over right then and there. Um, I, so yeah, this debate went on for a while, and every now and then someone you know, brings it back from the dead like some sort of zombie argument, and I'm amazed. <laughs> uh, Ruth? Hi, I'm Ruth Keefe. I'm with the USA Science and Engineering Festival. Hi. With all the tools you've described tonight, what opportunities do you see specifically for communicating about science? Do you reach people you didn't reach before? Do you have new ways of communicating complex scientific issues that weren't available to you before? Uh, so the question is, um, what kind of tools uh, are there for communicating about science in particular now? Um, so I think, for example, one simple uh, example would be the video that I showed before. So um, you ac can actually uh, illustrate an article a lot better with video in some cases than with static images. And people can actually understand something like biomechanics or, um, uh, uh, let me think, like molecular biology. If you see a really good visualization of what's going on inside a cell or how DNA is replicating, it's so much better than either just reading about it or looking at some pathetic little line drawing. Um, it's just, it's fantastic. And there's some amazing visualization being done now. Uh, I just love it. And, and that, I hope, in the future will be part of eBooks. Probably not a, on a Kindle in this kind of incarnation, but iPads are what are, iPads are gonna evolve into. You can definitely see that. But it, but it can't be, um, but you can't, you, you can't use those things like video um, sort of like on a DVD, you know, where you've got the movie and then you have the DVD extras that are sort of dumped in there. You can't do that. You have to think like Vesalius. His, his artwork and his text are, are beautifully integrated, and there's a lot of thought that goes into it. So there has to be a lot of thought about how video is going to be combined with, with text into one solid whole. It has to be all of a piece, I think, or it's just not going to work. Um, we, we have time for about three more questions. Great. I'll take two from Twitter, and then we'll wrap up with one from the live audience. <clears throat> this question comes from Solma Spence, who is a, a colleague at the academies. Her question is, Carl, how can institutions like the National Academies use new media to communicate with a wider audience? Well, um, it's, there, all the tools that I've described um, can be used by anybody. They can be used by just a, you know, a writer like me, they can be used by an uh, uh, individual scientist, or they can be used by an institution. Um, I think the particular challenge for an institution 
is not to um, institutionalize it in the sense of kind of squeezing all the life and spontaneity out of these things. Uh, I see that happen a lot. Um, and it's really kind of um, almost tragic when um, you know, some institution starts up a blog, like, hey, we've got a blog. We're hip. We're with it. But that each blog post has to go through you know, 10 steps of approval, and it gets the life squeezed out of it more and more with each step. You know what I'm talking about. Um, you know, what is the point of even doing that? I mean, what comes out at the end of that is, is not fit for consumption. Um, so, so you have to really think carefully about why you're using these tools and what you want them to come out with. Um, if you just say, oh, get me a blog, um, it, it's going to be a mess. Uh, one more question from Twitter and then back to you. This question comes to you, Carl, on Twitter from Sarah Jorgensen. And her question is, Carl, do you think that writers who primarily write electronically target, whether intentionally or not, a younger, less broad audience? Um, wow, they got that all into 140 characters. <laughs> I'm impressed. So the question was, um, are people who are writing primarily uh, electronically targeting uh, intentionally or unintentionally a younger audience? Um, yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, although, you know, I have to say, you know, the, the people who buy Kindle are older people because of glasses. I mean, that's, I think that's, I, I, that's my non-scientific uh, uh, statement on, on Kindles. I, I, I've seen a lot of people say that, oh, this is easier on my eyes and so on. Um, and uh, I don't know. I mean, I, yes, um, you know, young people get their news through Facebook or, or through, through their computer in lots of different ways. They're not interested in the, in, in the physical newspaper. Um, but that being said, um, you know, the, the uh, Pew Foundation did a survey recently where they, where they asked um, different age sets, where do you get your news? Where do you get your information? Um, and uh, I believe it was like people who were like um, 22 to 35 or something. Uh, one, of the, one of the top two places that they got their news was from the New York Times, I'm happy to say. Um, they got it online. But I mean, when I write a story for the New York Times, it's, it's, it's basically the same in print and on the web. So um, I think. I think this distinction like, oh, this is just for the kids, is one of these false debates in the way that, oh, blogging is not really journalism, is another false debate. In about a year, I think this debate will be dead, except for the people who insist on trying to revive it in its zombie state. And uh, you are welcome, Twitter users Soma Spence and uh, Judith Price. Uh, in the back, please. Hi, my name is Brianna Pobiner. I'm from the National Museum of Natural History. Hi. Um, I'm wondering with uh, Twitter and Facebook and blogging and sort of the University of Google, um, how, how do we help people out there sift through, besides um, uh, having a name like Discover behind you, how do we help people sift through science versus pseudoscience? Hmm. So the question is, how do we, I'm not sure who we are, uh, help uh, people to sift through science and pseudoscience online? And that's a, that's a, that's a very important question. Um, uh, so for example, I write a lot about evolution. And um, I, I'm sorry to say that creationists were way ahead of the scientific community in embracing the web. I would talk to evolutionary biologists uh, years ago and say, like, I, you know, you know, you should know that you know answers in Genesis and these people—they're all over the web. And so, uh, where are you? Uh, and um, so, I think I, in, I, I think there are a lot. I think there are lots of different ways. Um, but uh, uh, you know, I think. I, but I, I think the main thing is is um, either earning a reputation online or, or, or using an already valuable reputation in a, in a, in a, in a, in a useful way online um, so, that, um, so, that people will, that, so that people will listen to you. 
And so I'm happy to say that like, there are people who have said, you know, I've read a lot of your stuff, and uh, I get evolution now, and I want to thank you for that. And you know, they they've sort of understand, understand now how it's science, and it's, it's not out to get them or something. Um, but um, there really isn't an answer, a simple answer to that, except that uh, just through the very act of being online and, and using these tools, um, that's you know the, the only way around is, is through basically. Um, we can take one last question from the audience. I should mention as well that some people in the audience are tweeting. So, <laughs> do we have any final questions, um, ma'am? My name is Carla Gladstone, and I became part of the audience that you were trying to build. Uh, through reading a book in the public library. Mm. Um, could you comment on where you think uh, the e-books might have a role in our public libraries? So the question is, what is the role of e-books uh, in the future of public libraries? Um, you can actually borrow e-books from libraries now. That you, you, um, you just need to sign up with your, with, there are a lot of libraries. Where, uh, I believe what, the way it works is that you sign up on the library website, and you're just able to, to borrow books from the library on your Kindle or, or your iPad. So they've already been thinking about this, and it's already part of the system. Um, you know, librarians, it's, it's really interesting to have watched the evolution of librarians. I mean, they, they went from solely being you know, the keepers of the books and, and knowing you know, exactly which shelf to direct you to, um, to people who, who actually know how to get good information either in books or online and, and who they are the people now who a lot of people go to to get the good information. So they've become real gatekeepers for, this, uh, for, for good science. And so I think they need to be really supported in that, um, in, in helping people. Because people come to libraries still and they say, can you help me? Because they go on Google and they're just overwhelmed. Now actually librarians have lots of different tools including saying, well you can you know, you can, you can, uh, you've got your Kindle, so why don't you, why don't you borrow this ebook, and maybe this will answer your question. Well, Carl, I would like to thank you very much. Um, I would like to thank those of us who joined us here yes, in person you. this evening, as well as those who are watching online. Thank you.